So we give you all a very warm welcome uh, this morning to our meeting. We're going to enjoy a couple of hours of uh, fellowship together, and we very much look forward to what Brother David has prepared for us. And the title of his talk is Be a Hearer and a Doer of God's Word. Are you now, or have you ever been, a parent of young children? If you are, or if you have, you've probably said these words often. Why won't you just listen? Now, what are you actually asking of your child when you say those words? Are you asking them just to hear the words that you say, and just to hear what you say to them? Or are you asking a little bit more than that? Well, thinking about that can help us really to understand some of Jesus' words. We know that uh, Jesus was the greatest teacher ever to walk the earth. And he was an amazing speaker. So much so that that he astounded crowds of people, numbering into the thousands. And these people, they travelled long distances, they walked in the heat of the day, they even went hungry. Why? Why? just to hear Jesus' words, to hear Jesus speak. So they, they obviously had an interest, uh, and they put forth all that effort. Now, that being the case, why did Jesus say what he said at Matthew 11, verse 15? Let's check that. Matthew chapter 11. These people have put forward all this effort, and yet this is what he said to a crowd of people. Let the one who has ears listen. That's a strange expression, isn't it? Because obviously they all had ears, didn't they? But let the one who has ears listen. There's that word again that parents use with children, listen. So again, like parents, was he asking them to do a little bit more than simply to hear what he was saying? Well, if we look at uh, a few pages on to chapter 15 and verse 10, let's see what he was really asking them. Again, with a crowd, it says, With that, he called the crowd near and said to them, Listen and get the sense of it. Get the sense of it. The Phillips translation for this verse says, listen and understand this thoroughly. So he was wanting them to go a little bit further than just hearing his words. He wanted them to to get the point, didn't he? That's what he he wanted his audience to do. Because many of this crowd, they enjoyed hearing Jesus speak, and they traveled all these long distances. Oh, he says such things in such a wonderful way, such a wonderful speaker. And yet they were there for entertainment, really, weren't they? and not for for other purposes. And it's the same today. Millions uh, profess to have heard Jesus' words, and yet do they really get the sense of it? Do they really get the point? It's almost as if these people don't have ears to listen, uh, as Jesus said, because the words stay on the surface. It's like there's an invisible barrier with some people The words of Jesus and the words of of, of God in the Bible, they sit on the surface. They don't go any deeper than that. It's a bit like when you have uh, container plants on on a patio and you want to water them when the weather's been hot. Is it enough just to wet the surface of the plant? It's not, is it? Because that will quickly evaporate. You need to soak it thoroughly so that the water gets right down to the root ball to, to nourish the plant And it's very much the same with God's word. We need to absorb it thoroughly and to get the sense of it. So supposing then we've been humble enough to do that, to take the time to to have the interest to, to absorb God's word, what would the end result be? Well, the Bible says that faith follows the thing heard. So if we hear things and listen and get the sense of it, we can develop a strong faith. But is that the end result in itself? Well, that's where the title of this talk comes in. It says, be a hearer 
and a doer of God's word. This is highlighted for us in James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. You might want to put a marker in here, or, or you can use your history feature on your tablet to go back to it. But James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. This is really the theme scripture of our talk today. However, become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves with false reasoning. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, this one is like a man looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away and immediately forgets what sort of person he is. But the one who peers into the perfect law that belongs to freedom and continues in it has become not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. And he will be happy in what he does. So that's really the, the, what this talk is, is, is built around, that passage there. Let's examine this and we're going to do it a bit back to front though. We're going to look at verse 25 first. So it speaks about the perfect law. That's God's word, the Bible. That's quite straightforward, isn't that? But he uses that expression, uh, the one who peers into the perfect law. Now, again, it takes us to that thought, doesn't it, of looking beyond the surface, peering into to that. The, the dictionary says to peer means to examine carefully and minutely. The Greek word that James used here for to peer is to stoop down beside, to get down to examine something carefully. Reminds me of a child when a child sees an insect or something. They instinctively stoop down so they can see what, what's going on. Now, uh, I promised Elliot I wouldn't give him any plugs in this talk this morning, but uh, he's going to get one. Um, when he was little, um, he was fascinated by his pets the wood lice in the garden. <laughs> and he would stop and, and watch them for hours on end. He would take them for rides in his plastic wheelbarrow. <laughs> he was convinced that they enjoyed that. Um, but he would stoop down and watch what they were up to. He was fascinated. So he really wanted to get a closer look. And that's really how we have to be, isn't it, with, with God's word, the Bible. We need to get the sense of it, as Jesus said. And then... As the scripture we just read said, we won't be a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. So it's all about not just reading, getting the sense of it, but applying what we learn, being a doer. It, we have to view the Bible as a personal instruction to us, to me, from my creator Jehovah. That's the way we have to view the Bible, isn't it? And that should move us to action to do what's, what's asked of us. Now, people, when they've done this, they, they've actually been able to make an incredible transformation in their lives. Even people with very, very negative backgrounds and terrible bad habits that have been strongly uh, ingrained in them over the years, even people like that have been able to make a transformation. In fact, Paul spoke about these bad habits and former lifestyles as strongly entrenched things, things that are very difficult to shift. It's something strongly entrenched, like an opposing army. It's very difficult to shift. But Paul says we can overturn these strongly entrenched things because of what we're given through the Bible. In fact, he went on to remind the congregation in Corinth that he said this to. He said, before you became Christians, many of you were sexually immoral. You were idol worshippers. You were thieves, you were drunkards, and so on. But now, he said, you have been washed clean. You've been declared righteous in God's eyes. So they, they've made this transformation. They were able to overturn these strongly entrenched lifestyles. But can people who've been immersed in bad ways of life, can they really, really make a change like that? I'd like to read you some experiences. The first one is Mikhail Zuyev in Russia. 
His history is he was an illegal arms dealer. He says, when I was young, I loved fist fighting and playing with weapons, real weapons. I spent a lot of time in physical training and I also made illegal firearms, ammunition and knives. In time, I made this my business. I was well organized and very successful at selling my products to criminals. So did the Bible change Mikhail's life? Well, he says, in the early 1990s, I met Jehovah's Witnesses, but at first I didn't trust them. They asked too many questions for my liking. One day, one of them read to me Romans chapter 14 and verse 12. Each of us will render an account for himself to God. I wondered what I would say to God. And this moved me to learn what God required of me. I worked really hard at applying the Bible's counsel to, to change my personality, but I found it very difficult to make such changes. Strongly entrenched that this way of life, wasn't it? My former business associates kept offering me money for weapons, and I found it hard to restrain myself when people insulted me. Even so, I destroyed my large and valuable arsenal. As I learned of the love that God and Christ have shown for me, I was moved to love them. I persevered in my personal study, attended meetings with the local congregation, and prayed for God's help. So how did he change? How did he benefit? Little by little, he says, but with much struggling, and with the help of my Christian brothers, I have developed a Christian personality. Understanding that Jehovah God cares for each of us, even for people who've died, thrills me. I value the sincerity and openness that I observe amongst my brothers and sisters, Jehovah's Witnesses. And I appreciate the genuine interest that they've shown in me and their loyalty to God. I am now happy that my life is no longer dedicated to selling weapons of war, but is devoted to helping others learn about the God of peace. That's a real transformation, isn't it? Strongly entrenched habits and, and way of life were overturned uh, because he became a doer of God's word. Here's another one. This is uh, Renato. I was addicted to alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, crack cocaine, and I sniffed glue. Having lost almost everything I owned, I became a beggar. But after accepting the offer of a Bible study, I changed my life completely. I came to know God as a person. Even though I still have to fight against feelings of guilt and worthlessness, I have learned to lean upon God's mercy and loving kindness. I am sure that God will continue to give me the strength to overcome my negative feelings. Getting to know Bible truth is the best thing that ever happened to me. So another one who was able to overturn these strongly entrenched patterns of life. But even though someone has made that transformation, the process is still not complete in becoming a doer of God's word. If we look back at James chapter 1, so keep your Bible, Bible open there, James chapter 1. Um, notice it starts off in verse 22 by saying, become doers of the word. Now it's interesting, when we go to verse 25, it's the last part, it says, to be a doer of the work. So the word has changed, isn't it? A doer of the word must also be a doer of the work. Now, this is where we see a marked difference between those who claim to be Christian and true worshippers. Uh, we know that Jesus was a happy person. He had a happy uh, personality because he was like his father, Jehovah God. And the Bible says that God is the happy God. It says that clearly. 
And yet Jesus on occasions got very angry, righteously angry. Here's one occasion, Matthew 7. Let's check it together. Again, remember to keep that marker in James. Matthew 7. Verse 21 to 23. So Jesus said, Not everyone saying to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of the heavens, but only the one doing the will of my Father who is in the heavens will. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and expel demons in your name? And perform many powerful works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, many today who call themselves Christian might find those words puzzling. Why would Jesus direct such strong words to people who've been performing many powerful works in his name. The churches of Christendom have sponsored charities and built schools and hospitals, helped poor people, and many other good works. So to see why they've earned Jesus' anger, let's think about an illustration. Imagine you're uh, a parent, maybe a father and mother perhaps, and you're, you're one of the parents, And you have to take a long trip. Now, for good reasons, you can't take your children with you. So what you do is you hire an experienced, qualified childminder, a live-in childminder, to care for your children while you're away. Now, your instructions to this childminder are simple. Take care of our children. Feed them. Make sure they're clean and keep them from harm. Quite straightforward, that, isn't it? I'll just read that again. Take care of our children, feed them, make sure they're clean, and keep them from harm. Now, when you get back from your trip, you find, in fact, you're shocked to see that your children are famished, they're undernourished, they're dirty, they're sick, and they're miserable. They're crying for the babysitter's attention, but their cries go unheeded. Why? Because the childminder is up on a ladder washing the windows. Furious, you demand an explanation. The childminder replies, What? Look at all that I did. And the windows clean, they're sparkling. I made repairs on the house for you. I've done loads of things since you've been away. Would the parents feel better? Hardly. They'd never asked her to do those jobs, did they? They just wanted their children to be cared for. And her refusal to heed those instructions would rightly infuriate them. And really, Christendom has acted like that babysitter. Jesus left instructions with, uh, with his representatives to feed people spiritually by teaching them the truth of God's word and to help them to be spiritually clean. But Christendom has dismally failed to obey Jesus' direction. In fact, um, she's left people spiritually starved, confused by, by falsehoods about God, and ignorant of even basic Bible truths. Even her attempts to better this world can hardly excuse her willful disobedience. No wonder Jesus was angry at that situation. Jesus really felt for people. When he did tours as a preacher and teacher, he felt pity for people, the Bible says. Why did he feel pity? Because they were thrown about like sheep without a shepherd. No spiritual shepherds to guide them and give them spiritual guidance. What was Jesus' solution for that problem? To build schools and hospitals? No. He said to his disciples, these people are skinned and thrown about like sheep without a shepherd. Therefore, beg the master of the harvest to send out more workers. 
that was the solution Jesus wanted, people to teach the good news of the kingdom. That's the work that we've been asked to do. So can you consider this for a moment? Are we hearers only or are we doers of the work? What part does the ministry play in our lives? You might consider this another illustration. Imagine you've been invited to a wonderful six-course dinner in a five-star hotel cooked by Michelin-starred chefs, like Master Chef on steroids. <laughs> Imagine you're there, you're sitting down to this banquet, and you're really looking forward to this. You haven't had any lunch just to build up a really good appetite for this meal. And your stomach's rumbling a bit and you sit down and along comes this wonderful first course. And it looks amazing. And you're just about to put the first forkful in your mouth and you look up. And at the windows, you see crowds of people, emaciated. You see their ribs sticking out, dressed in rags, young people and old. And they're staring through the window as you put each forkful to your mouth. Could you enjoy that meal? If you could sit and enjoy it, then perhaps you would be a, a hero only. But it really shows the responsibility on us, doesn't it? Because we have a spiritual banquet, <laughs> don't we? We have so many good things. We have answers to our questions. We have peace, peace of mind. We have a wonderful brotherhood. And above all, we have a relationship with the creator of the universe, that, who we can go to with any problem. So we have such a spiritual banquet. Can we see our responsibility? The people out there are starving. They're in rags spiritually. So we can see where we come in, can't we, in being a doer of the work as well as a doer of the word. Being a, a, a doer of the word and the work, though, takes us into other areas as well as the ministry. Because we could have a superb ministry and still fail in our personal lives. Let's look back at James again for a moment. That passage, uh, 22 to 25. Um, notice verse 23, it uses that illustration there of looking in a mirror. And then in verse 24, he says that some might look at themselves and go away and forget all about it. Now, when we get up in the morning, we usually look in the mirror to see what adjustments we need to make, don't we? In fact, we compare with what we actually look like after getting up from bed with what we want to look like, <laughs> and we try and make some adjustments. But as we engage in our activities and day-to-day -day life, we don't keep thinking about what we saw in the mirror. We, f we forget all about that as the day goes on, don't we? This can happen in a spiritual sense as well, though. As we look into our mirror, God's Word, we can compare what we are with what Jehovah wants us to be. So our, we, we come face to face with our weaknesses sometimes when we look in the mirror, don't we? And we make adjustments uh, we, in our personality or, or our daily lives to conform with what, we, what God wants us to be. But as we go about our daily activities, <coughs> problems arise and difficulties to deal with we might stop thinking about we, what we saw in the mirror. And that's really where problems uh, can arise. You think of the, the Israelites when they left the nation of Egypt. They actually went so far as to build a golden calf and worship it. Now, they'd seen so much. They'd seen the delivery from the nation of Egypt, from slavery, They'd seen the miraculous ten plagues, the miraculous dividing of the Red Sea, the destruction of Pharaoh and his armies. They'd seen so much. And yet, after a while, if you think of, of, of their initial reaction, first of all, rather, they were singing and rejoicing and dancing, weren't they? They were so happy that Jehovah had delivered them. And yet, it was almost as if they suffered a major memory loss. Because very soon after that, they started complaining. Oh, I wish we were back in Egypt. We had leeks and garlic in Egypt. Forgot all about the slavery and the lashings and all the rest of it, didn't they? 
major memory loss. They even went so far, as he said, to worship idols. So they became, as James said in that scripture there, forgetful hearers. It wasn't as if they wanted to leave Jehovah's worship. They wanted to, to still be a worshiper of Jehovah. In fact, when they had that golden calf and had that festival, what did they call the occasion? A festival to Jehovah with that idol in the background. So they didn't want to leave Jehovah's worship, but they, they had this major memory loss, what Jehovah told them about idol worship. Now, this can happen with us. We, we're well known for our high moral principles as Jehovah's people. But often when tempted with sexual immorality, for instance, some Christians have stopped thinking about God and his principles. It's almost as if they suffer this major memory loss. They have become, as James said, forgetful hearers. At first, it may not be an act of fornication, it may be something like an inclination to delve into pornography, to indulge in flirting or pursuing close association with morally weak people. All of these things have led Christians into sinful conduct. That's why the Apostle Paul said, let him that thinks he is standing beware that he does not fall. Now, these Israelites who, who made this golden calf, as far as they were concerned, they were still worshippers of Jehovah. They thought they were standing. But they went that far away from what Jehovah asked them to do with this, this major memory loss that they had. So what is it that can prevent us from becoming forgetful hearers? Suffering spirit, spiritual memory loss. Well, thinking of physical memory loss, that often comes with aging, doesn't it? You forget what you've gone into a room for and stuff like that, and where was I again? And, you know, just this memory loss is, is part of aging. So the publication Healthy Aging says this is what we should do to prevent this from happening. Four points. One, stay mentally active. Use your brain, puzzles, crosswords, whatever it is. Two, socialize regularly. Don't isolate yourself. Three, get organized. Get a good routine. And four, get enough exercise. Okay? Now that makes sense, all those things, to stop our physical memory from deteriorating. But the same kind of routine can help us avoid spiritual memory loss. Remember them? It was mentally active, socialize regularly, get organized, and get exercise. So mentally active, in a spiritual sense, of course, would be daily Bible reading, wouldn't it? Weekly meeting preparation, family worship, etc. Socialize regularly was the second one. That's why we're here today, isn't it? Not just to worship Jehovah and learn about him, but also to be with our brothers and sisters. And it's worth it sometimes just for the smiles and the welcome you get when you come along. Get organized was the next one. A good spiritual routine then is what we need, a schedule. Not just fitting things in as and when we can, because then they tend to get left out, don't they? And fourth that was mentioned for memory improvement was exercise. That's where the ministry comes in. The ministry is where we exercise our faith, isn't it? We speak about the hope we have. We defend our beliefs with people. Defend Jehovah against false accusations. It keeps us sharp and exercised. These things then can help us to remain doers of the word and doers of the work. What's the result for us then if we do all these things? <coughs> if we look at verse 25. It says, the one who peers into the perfect law that belongs to freedom and continues in it has become not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. And here's the result. He will be happy in what he does. So our God, the happy God, we mentioned earlier, wants us 
to be happy as well. And that is why he wants us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Thank you very much, uh, Brother David. Your uh, lively illustrations kept us all awake this morning, so we uh, thank you for that. And isn't it nice that we're not like that nanny that uh, doesn't pay attention to the important things, or like that person having a meal at the expense of everybody else around them. So thank you very much, Brother David. Appreciate that.